We're going to get straight to it. Uh, something very unusual happened in the life of the Catholic Church. I've never heard of anything like this before um, in the history of the Catholic Church. Something happened that you probably don't know about yet, but I want to bring you the information as it's developing. As you know, just a little bit of background here. As you know, in 2013, what is it now, 2020, so not quite seven years ago, Pope Benedict XVI abdicated his papacy. And people use different terms. He retired. He abdicated. He um, resigned. Whatever the ter terminology is, he left the papacy to live in obscurity. He's living, in fact, in a, um, a converted, um, it was a former convent. And it's been converted for his personal use. So it's his personal quarters. It's on the grounds of the Vatican City State. It's kind of, if you were looking at St. Peter's, if you were standing in the Basilica or Piazza out front, and you're looking towards St. Peter's, his, his little retirement place is behind that and slightly off to the right, up in the Vatican Gardens area there. In fact, when I was there in Rome in late October, I, I, I went with um, a bishop friend of mine, around to the back of St. Peter's, because he's a bishop, so he can get in all kinds of uh, special doorways and things. So the, the Swiss guards let Nancy and me and our bishop friend, and we, we went back into the Vatican Gardens, back behind St. Peter's, where you can see this building. In any case, that's where Pope Benedict XVI has resided for these last nearly seven years in his retirement. And some people refer to him as the Pope Emeritus, uh, some people are very bothered by that because, you know, we only have one Pope at one time. Therefore, is it really helpful to call him Pope Emeritus? And then there's the big brouhaha that's been going on now for years as to whether or not did he really resign his papacy? Was it really effective? Was, he, did he, was there a defect in the way he did it? And people are arguing and frothing at the mouth over that. And that's a whole separate issue. We won't even get into that. So in the midst of all this, Oh, and one more thing I want to mention right up front. I have great admiration for Pope Benedict XVI. I really like him. In fact, before he was, uh, I almost said canonized, but before he was elected Pope, after Pope John Paul II died, so this is now 2000, uh, what was it, 2005? <laughs> I'm getting mixed up on my numbers. So, yeah, roughly 2005, Pope, yeah, it was 2005, Pope John Paul II died after a very long pontificate, Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI, he had asked several times Pope John Paul II, he had asked him if he could be allowed to retire and go back to Germany and write books and play piano and do the stuff that he really loves to do because he's an intellectual guy and he wants to get back to the things that he really wanted to do for the rest of his life. And Pope John Paul II, for whatever his reasons were, he said, no, I need you here. Next thing you know, in that conclave, formally... Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, is now Pope Benedict XVI. He gets elected. So now he is our Pope for the next, uh, I guess, approximately seven, eight years. Now, just before he was elected, there was, I, I assume that this website is still there. I don't know. It's called, it's called BeliefNet. Kaylin, can you look up BeliefNet and see if it's still operating? I think it probably is. It was one of these let's kind see. of proto. Yes, Cyrus? Oh, I just said let's Oh, see. Kaylin, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can see. I'm looking it up. I'm too busy talking uh, to let my fingers fly on the keyboard. So I'm leading up to something, everybody. Don't worry. Follow the popcorn trail. We're going to get there. And it'll be all the more interesting for it. Just break in whenever you find out. Beliefnet.com? Uh, yes. It comes up for me. Yeah. Does it? Okay. So they're still in business. I just haven't heard about them in a long time. Thank you for that, Kaylin. So Beliefnet, it was one of these proto-religious blogs. There are a bunch of them now where you kind of aggregate a bunch of writers on religious themes and their different categories for Protestant and Catholic. And, oh, I know the, I know the website address. Yeah, it's just I wasn't sure if they were still in operation. That's all. Um, and so the, the editors of BeliefNet, before the election of Pope Benedict XVI, so again, after Pope John Paul II dies, the preparations for the conclave were underway. The conclave, if you're not familiar with the term, it just means the the meeting of the cardinals who are going to vote for the next pope under lock and key they will meet at the vatican and they go into the chambers where they will live and vote and eat etc 
And the term conclave comes from the word in Latin for key, meaning that they get locked in. And that's the idea, so that nobody can interfere and eavesdrop and maybe uh, sway the election one way or the other. So BeliefNet editors get in touch with me and say, hey, we've got a bunch of folk from various uh, religious backgrounds in, within the world of Christianity, and we would like to uh, have you guys do a kind of mock conclave, meaning that all of you will be like the cardinal electors, and it will be this public conclave that we'll have on BeliefNet, and you'll cast your vote for which candidate you want to be the next pope and explain why you want this person, etc. So I cast my vote and as one of these you know, fake cardinals, uh, I cast it, I cast, cast it? No, I cast my vote for Cardinal Ratzinger. And I was in the minority. And this was back when people still believed the nonsense that Pope Benedict XVI, as, as Cardinal Ratzinger, that he was God's Rottweiler nonsense, that he was this kind of pit bull reactionary churchman who just was iron-fisted and he crushed any opposite. Absolutely untrue. In fact, exactly the opposite of the kind of persona and the sensitivity and the erudition, etc., cetera, of, of Cardinal Ratzinger, a very gentle, soft-spoken man, but a guy who really knows the faith very well. It's one reason why he was elected pope. So I cast my vote, and everybody was like, oh, yeah, there's no way he's ever going to win. No way. And he wins. <laughs> and I was pleased with myself, but I wasn't the only one who was predicting it. I was hoping that he would get elected. And, in, and sure enough, he did. So that's kind of, for me at least, that's the backstory. So now we've lived with Pope Francis, who succeeded Pope Benedict XVI when he abdicated the papacy. Pope Francis now has been Pope for not quite seven years. And coming right back to what I said a moment ago, or several moments ago, something very unusual happened in the life of the Catholic Church yesterday. And I will read you the press release from Ignatius Press, a premier Catholic publishing house. They're headquartered in San Francisco, California. Uh, I'm old friends with the president of the uh, publishing company, Mark Brumley, and I've known Father Fessio for many years, and uh, Eva, and all the, all the uh, people who work at Ignatius Press. I, I've known them and admired their work for a long time. So, because I keep an eye on all the doings at Ignatius Press on social media, I was interested when this popped up. This is a press release. The Catholic Church faces a major crisis, and the turmoil in priestly ministry is at the heart of it. The priesthood is going through a dark time, wrote Pope Emeritus Benedict and Cardinal Robert Seurat. Wounded by the revelation of so many scandals, disconcerted by the constant questioning of their consecrated celibacy, many priests are tempted by the thought of giving up and abandoning everything. So you're saying, okay, that's a quote. What's that a quote from? That is a quote from a new book that is rolling off the presses even as we speak, published by Ignatius Press, authored, co-authored by Pope Emeritus Benedict and Cardinal Robert Seurat. I posted a picture of Cardinal Seurat last night because I knew that this was going to be a topic of, uh, of great interest. So if, you, if you're not familiar with him, go to my Twitter feed, at Patrick Madrid. I didn't post a caption or anything. I just posted a picture of him. And uh, he is uh, from Africa. He is uh, a Franco Francophone. And so his primary language is French, but he also, I believe, can speak a few other languages as well. And he is a cardinal. He's in charge of uh, the sacraments, uh, divine worship in the sacraments, I think, is his uh, dicastery that he heads up in Rome. So this is the, this amazing, and I would argue even perhaps earth-shaking kind of development that took place while you were asleep. And that is that a former pope, Pope Benedict XVI, along with Cardinal Robert Seurat, has written a book publicly petitioning the current pope, Pope Francis, to not take a step in a direction that Pope Benedict XVI very ardently believes would be a step in the wrong direction. It has to do with priestly celibacy. So this book is the cri de cour, as, they, as it would be in French, you know, the cry from the heart. And I will read you the rest of this press release from Ignatius Press. Quote, in this book, Pope Emeritus Benedict and Cardinal Robert Seurat give their brother priests and the whole church a message of hope. They honestly address the spiritual challenges faced by priests today, including struggles of celibacy. 
They point to deeper conversion to Jesus Christ as the key to faithful and fruitful priestly ministry and church reform. From the depths of our hearts, which again is the title of the book, from the depths of our hearts is an unprecedented work by the Pope Emeritus and a cardinal serving in the Vatican. As bishops, they write, quote, in a spirit of filial obedience to Pope Francis, who has said, quote, I think that celibacy is a gift for the church. I don't agree with allowing optional celibacy. No, now this was a recent quote from Pope Francis. Keep in mind, and this is me speaking now, that this is in the backdrop, or with against the backdrop, of the Amazon Synod, as it's popularly known, in which there was a strong push to abolish priestly celibacy in the form of, I, ar- I would argue that it's, it's an effort on the part of some people to abolish the practice, the discipline of priestly celibacy. And the, I see it as kind of a Trojan horse. In the, those who are promoting it are saying, well, look, the terrain is very difficult in the Amazon, and it takes forever to get from one remote village to another remote village, and many people are unable to receive the sacraments as a result, and because the Eucharist is so important, we want to make sure that there are sufficient numbers of priests to be able to accommodate these people who need the sacraments, but they can't get to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's a valid point. I mean, this is not the only place in the world where this exists. I've traveled in some remote areas in Latin America and elsewhere where it is pretty clear that it would be a tough thing for a priest to get to this particular village uh, on a regular basis. I'm thinking about some places in remote parts of Mexico, for example. So there's nothing wrong with pointing out that issue, but my concern, and I I think I share a concern that other people have as well, and now I can see that I share the same concern that Pope Emeritus Benedict has in Cardinal Seurat, and that is that If it's begun in the Amazon, if the viri probati, that's the Latin phrase you're likely to run into if you uh, read up on these topics, so viri probati means approved men or tested men, meaning laymen, like myself, Uh, although I have no interest in the job, but the point is is somebody who's been married uh, quite a while, they've raised their family, they're stable, they have a stable marriage, they are serious Catholics, etc., etc., Let's take these laymen and ordain them for the priesthood so that they, these viri probati, would be in a position to administer the sacraments in remote areas where other priests couldn't easily get to. Now, there's a logic to that, and I don't deny the logic, and I, 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 I understand it, but I think it's the wrong solution to a real problem, which is the lack of um, priests available to celebrate the sacraments. And from what I can tell, I have not read the book yet. Nobody's really read the book yet, although I, I'm hopeful that I will have an opportunity to read it in the very near future. But going back to what Pope Benedict XVI is saying in this unprecedented book, he's saying, you know, look, we are, we're saying this to you, Pope Francis, in a spirit of filial obedience. These are the exact words that are used in the, in the press release. So they're not challenging Pope Francis. Some people are trying to spin it that way. How dare they do that? They're restricting the freedom of the Pope because blah, blah, blah. The The usual suspects are already whipped into a frenzy on this one. There, you can see it on Twitter. They're just spinning like tops. They're angry. They're in a frenzy. And how dare Pope Benedict and, and Pope Emeritus Benedict, let's underline that part. How dare he say anything? Well, guys, he happens to have been Pope, okay, for one thing. That, that would be one pretty high-level qualification. If you have that on your resume, I think that commands a bit more attention than some theologian at a college somewhere. Anyway, so in the midst of all this, um, the, the press release continues. From the depths of our hearts is an unprecedented work by Pope Emeritus and a cardinal serving in the Vatican. As bishops, they write in a spirit of filial obedience to Pope Francis, who has said, again, Quoting Pope Francis here, I think that celibacy is a gift for the church. I don't agree with the with allowing optional celibacy. No. Ignatius Press says, responding to calls for refashioning the priesthood, including proposals from the Amazonian Synod, two wise, spiritually astute pastors explain the biblical and spiritual role of the priesthood, celibacy, and genuine priestly ministry. Drawing on Vatican II, They present priestly celibacy as more than a mere precept of ecclesiastical law. They insist that renewal of the church is bound to a renewed understanding of priestly vocation as sharing in Jesus' priestly identity as bridegroom of the church. This is a book whose crucial crucial message 
is for clergy and laity alike. Now, this is an important point here. It's a subtle point, but it's important. Drawing on Vatican II, because if you've been following the the, the quote-unquote culture wars within the Catholic Church for lo these last 50 years or so since the Second Vatican Council, one of the arguments that's often attempted to be used against a traditional position on whatever is, well, Vatican II changed that. Oh, really? Where exactly did it change? I'll never forget a discussion I had with a Catholic priest. I won't say where, but it's, it, it, it's an, it was an instructive story for me. I was speaking at a Catholic parish, and everything was going great. The priest seemed to love the talk, and at the intermission, he said, hey, this is great, I really like it. Afterward, because I did a and a session, as I typically do after a break in the middle, um, one of the guys from the Knights of Columbus or whatever said, hey, Father so-and-so is like really steamed at you right now. And I thought, wow, he seemed pretty happy when I talked to him an hour ago. So I went over to him. I said, Father, is there anything wrong? And he was furious. He's, and he said, how dare you tell these people here that women can never be ordained priests? <laughs> I said, well, um, maybe because I guess Pope John Paul II just recently came out with Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, his uh, very brief document on priestly ordination and why the Church is unable to ordain women to the priesthood for the reasons that he listed. And he just sort of dismissed it. He says, well, that, that's irrelevant. Vatican II changed all that. I said, really? Because, like, I'm pretty familiar with the documents of Vatican II. Can you tell me which document I would find that in? And that probably wasn't that most helpful thing to say because it just made him more angry. And he said, yeah, well, John Paul II. And I said, don't forget, he was at, he was a bishop at Vatican II. He was there. And that didn't help either. <laughs> so, long story short, the conversation kind of, went downhill from there, and uh, what I found out subsequently was he was angry because he had been telling the congregation that it's okay, in due time, we're going to ordain women, it's going to happen, don't worry, forget about John Paul II, what does he know? And so when, during the Q&A period, when the question came up, and I just gave the church's answer, that's what lit off this powder keg. Now, we have so many good and wonderful priests in the Catholic Church. I know, I'm privileged to know many of them. So this story about this particular incident, don't let that dishearten you, because thankfully we have so many good priests who do, in fact, preach the gospel and teach things. And I guess in a way I wasn't surprised, I was sad, but I wasn't surprised when years later I read in the newspaper that that priest who had given me such a hard time for speaking the truth about what the Church teaches on the priesthood, that he got caught up in scandals and he got dismissed from the priesthood. So I guess in a way that sort of helped me understand his vehemence when we were talking years earlier about this issue. But this brings us back to the question about what they say in the press release about how what Pope Benedict XVI, emeritus, and, uh, and Cardinal Seurat are saying in this new book, that when they're, they're appealing to Pope Francis not to change this teaching, because there are people who really want to—it's not a teaching, excuse me, I misspoke—this discipline in the Church, because there are people who adamantly want this discipline to go away. And I said Trojan horse, I think it's going to take the form, if it should happen, that it would be permitted maybe— in the Amazon, and then eventually it would spread. I think it would spread. I don't think I don't see how it couldn't spread, especially if you have like Germany, and many of the bishops there who are really gung ho about the idea of removing priestly celibacy. How do you withstand their claims to say, well, if they can do if they can do it over there, how come we can't do it here? And I think if it were to go in that direction, we would see a lot of that. So in, in their appeal, notice that they're appealing to Vatican II. This is key. And also, one little detail for your good-to-know file, don't forget, Joseph Ratzinger, formerly Pope Benedict XVI, he was an expert, aperitus is the Latin, the Latin word for that, aperitus, the, the periti, the plural, plural of uh, experts, peritus, he was a peritus. He was one of the theological experts who was brought in by his bishop, to be there with his expertise to help shape the documents of the Second Vatican Council. 
So by appealing to the Second Vatican Council, they're removing this potential argument. Well, you guys are going, you're trying to go back to the Middle Ages. You're trying to go back to the Council of... No. We're trying to continue the work of the Second Vatican Council insofar as it, too, upheld the discipline of priestly celibacy. That's what is at stake here. This is, um, I've never heard of anything like this ever happening before. Now, in the, in, the, in the book, at least the portions of the book that have been excerpted in Le Figaro, for example, a French publication, you will find phrases like this, I humbly beg, Pro- Pope, I humbly beg Pope Francis to, and the, there's an ellipsis, veto any weakening of the law of priestly celibacy even limited, limited to one or the other region. This is the, these are the words here from Cardinal Seurat. And the reason that there's so much writing on this, I think anyway, is that it, it could be, if it were to happen in this way, that by making a change to the discipline of priestly celibacy, which is where a man freely chooses a life of consecrated celibacy for the sake of the gospel, which Jesus himself speaks about, by the way, in Matthew chapter 19, where he says, some men are eunuchs. This is a euphemism, by the way. The word eunuch here, you know what a eunuch is, right? I don't think I need to explain that. Um, It's a family show and all, so you get the idea. But Jesus uses this term to describe men who do not procreate, men who do not live with women as man and wife, if you follow my meaning. So in Matthew 19, Jesus says there are some men who who have been made eunuchs by others in the old-fashioned sense of the term. Um, But he he comes to the point where he says, but there are some who are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Again, this is a euphemism. He's using a kind of a, a roundabout way of making his point. Those, he says, are the ones who have given up the, the joys and the happiness of marriage and, ch- and having children, etc., and everything that goes with that. And they've done so for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He says, this is not for everybody, but for those to whom it is granted, they should accept it. So, a little, little background in the historical aspect of all this. Some people say, yeah, but St. Peter was married. Yeah, we know he was married because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. You don't get a mother-in-law unless you're married. And that's true. We're told in the Gospels that Simon Peter and any number of the other apostles left their families. They left everything to follow Jesus. So in a way, it kind of defeats the argument. Well, they, they were married. Yeah, they were married, but they also didn't live as married men anymore. That's the key. They, even though they were married, some of them at least, they did not, they did not continue their conjugal relationship. And I don't mean that in just a sexual sense, but they didn't They didn't live like they had lived before, as the pater familias, with their kids around them and their wife and, you know, dinner on the table when work is over. They left all that. They gave it up for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and they followed Jesus wherever he went. So remember, there will be some people who will try to make a big deal about how the apostles, some of them were married, but when you, upon further inspection, you realize that that argument actually uh, collapses in on itself if it's an attempt to say that, yes, we should have a married priesthood. Now, when we come back from this break, I want to share with you a little bit more of the historical background on this and also draw your attention to why this issue is so important. I mean, something truly remarkable happened yesterday. We've got a retired pope, Pope Benedict XVI, emeritus, publicly petitioning the current pope, Pope Francis, to please, please, please don't change this teaching. I can't emphasize how big of a story this is. Who knows how much bigger it's going to get? We'll see. We're talking about this bombshell that came out yesterday, at least in the form of a press release. If you're just tuning in, just a quick recap. Pope Benedict XVI, Emeritus, he's been in retirement now for nearly seven years after he uh, resigned the papacy. And he and a current cardinal, Cardinal Robert Seurat, who is the, I believe he's the prefect for the Congregation of Sacraments and Divine Worship. And I, I, I need to double check that. But in any case, he's a currently functioning cardinal at the Vatican. And the two of them, Pope, the former Pope Benedict and Cardinal Seurat, have released a book 
called From the Depths of Our Hearts, which is an appeal to Pope Francis in the form of a book explaining all the reasons why they are entreating him not to change the church's discipline of priestly celibacy. Now, there, there are, there's, a, there's a lot of, I guess, maybe misinformation swirling around out there, everything from people saying, yeah, well, the only reason that they have priestly celibacy in the Catholic Church is because back in the days when priests were married, uh, their kids would inherit things like churches and lands and things that didn't really belong to them, but because the dad was the priest, they, that's nonsense. Nonsense. That was never a reason why the Church felt one way or the other on the issue of celibacy for priests. And there are other assorted arguments that you'll sometimes find, and usually when you hear them, you can tell pretty quickly that the person does not have a grounding in the actual history of this, which is why I'd like to recommend to you two books, so that if you really do want a serious historical treatment with names named and dates and uh, all the historical details that we have extant at our fingertips, I would recommend these two books. One is Apostolic Origins, The Apostolic Origins of Priestly Celibacy. This is by Christian Cochini, also published by Ignatius Press, and, for value added, published by a Jesuit priest. Keep in mind that Pope Francis is a Jesuit. So, Christian Cochini, S.J., he wrote this book, and I read the book not long after it came out, and I was very impressed by how comprehensive and truly exhaustive it is in its historical analysis of how just how prevalent was married clergy in the early church. I mean, it was there, certainly, and you find any number of uh, uh, stories about uh, priests who were married, and even, if, in fact, in the early church, uh, bishops who were married. But it died out rather quickly, as the historical evidence demonstrates the the ideal from the very beginning it was always understood that the ideal was to be like Jesus is and Jesus is well certainly in his priestly in his uh, public ministry he was a celibate can you imagine Jesus well, i think i've talked about this before but let's just talk about it for a second can you imagine if Jesus had not been celibate and you're thinking okay well that's kind of neat Jesus would have kids Think about how weird that would have been. Because when you're married, you forsake all others, right? Right? And when you're married, you give your, or at least you're supposed to, give the best of your time and attention to your wife and your children. If you're a man, if you're a woman, you give your time and attention to your husband and to your children. Imagine if Jesus had been married. It'd be like, okay, guys, I'm going home now. See you next, you know, it's Friday. I'll see you on Monday. Well, what, what do you mean, Jesus? I mean, aren't you, are you, are you going to stop healing people and preaching? Yeah, I got, I got, I've been away all week. My kids haven't seen me for a week. I got to go see my kids. Got to see my wife. Poor thing. She's been handling all the duties at home while I've been gone. It's not fair to her for me to leave her. And then not only would Jesus have to unplug from his ministry, but then there would be one particular person that he would love above and beyond everyone else. And there would be a group of particular children that Jesus would, naturally, if he were a father. I love my children more than anyone else's children. I love other people, and I'm happy to, to do good and, and etc. for other people, but I have a special, unique love for my own children that I don't have for anyone else's children. And that's just normal. That's how you feel about your children. That's how you feel about your wife, or at least you should anyway. That's how you feel about your husband. And that's how Jesus, being human, of course he's God, but he's also human. I mean, they would, it would put him into such a strange and unworkable situation if he were married and had children, which he wasn't and didn't. And the early church, beginning with the apostles, they recognized this and so, as Simon Peter and the other apostles left everything we're told in the Gospels, dropped their fishing nets, said goodbye to their wives and kids, and said, we're going with Jesus, come what may, because they realized that they couldn't do both. They couldn't have one foot in both worlds. Sorry, Jesus, I'm off the clock now. I, well, I, 
I thought you were going to come follow me. Yeah, I, yeah, 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 I will. But I, I, I got to get back home because, you know, my wife is, she, you know, we have a baby on the way and we've got kids and it's just, it's not, it's not fair to her. So I'll be back next week. Okay. I just, I need two weeks off Jesus. It would be impossible. And when you think about it, ludicrous. Now, back to what Jesus said. I, I reference what Jesus said in Matthew 19 about uh, celibacy. And here are the exact words. So this is uh, Matthew 19, verse 10. The apostles who had been questioning him about divorce and remarriage, and, you know, back in the days of Moses, he allowed people to get divorced. How? And Jesus says, you know, that's what you used to do back then because of the hardness of your hearts. But I tell you, if a man divorces his wife and marries another one, he commits adultery. So verse 10, his disciples said to him, if that is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. He said to them, not all can accept this word, but only those to whom it is granted. Some are incapable of marriage. Now, this is a, a, a euphemism for being a eunuch. The more literal translation is a eunuch. So this is the New American Bible. Some are incapable of marriage because they were born so. Some because they were made so by others. Some because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever can, keep the, whoever can accept this ought to accept it. Now, St. Paul amplifies this teaching of Jesus here about the importance of consecrated celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. And you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 9, and also verses 32 through 35, where he speaks at length about how important it is for those who want to follow the Lord in a single-minded way, in other words, in, in ministry, for example, or in religious life in the case of men and women, and how important it is to not be divided so if you want some additional kind of apostolic emphasis on this issue, and what this points to is that the early church at the time of the apostles was really aware, they were very clear, that Jesus was calling certain people, not everybody, but certain people, those, he says, who can accept it, those for whom this is given should accept it, this free choice to forsake the, the wonderful, beautiful life of marriage, and all that goes with it, including the beauty of having children, etc., and follow Jesus. And that's what's at stake here. This is not—I saw some ridiculous claim in one of the uh, um, articles that was written hastily since yesterday about this topic, uh, alleging that the, the discipline of priestly celibacy only goes back 800 years. Poppycock. It goes back to the time of the apostles. Now, it wasn't universal— and the book by Cochini points this out. It wasn't universal, but it clearly was the ideal. It clearly was what was seen to be striven for. And more and more, as we move out beyond the time of the apostles and into the early church fathers, so by the time we get to, say, St. Augustine, it is very, very unusual that you would find any clergy in the West I'm talking about here. I mean, yes, I know in the Eastern churches and in what we now think of as the Orthodox churches, they do have married clergy. But even in those churches, it's still recognized that celibacy has a pride of place. Bishops, for example, eparchs, are not permitted to be married. The only men who can be ordained a bishop in any of the Eastern Rite churches or in the Eastern Orthodox churches are men who are celibate. The married clergy, it was seen as a kind of concession. In any case, when you consider the evidence, you see that this, this is an organic development that has, although it is not in itself doctrinal, it has a doctrinal underpinning. In other words, it's closely connected to doctrine, in a way similar to this. It is not doctrine. It's not like a, a, a defined church doctrine, per se, that you cannot receive Holy Communion unless you're in the state of, of um, what's, what's there, well, let me phrase it a different way, that if you're divorced and remarried, that you cannot receive Holy Communion. That, that is a custom of, it's a long-standing custom, really, going back to the time of the Apostles, but it's rooted in the doctrinal reality of what you're receiving in the, in the Eucharist. You're receiving Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So, yes, it is a custom, it is a discipline, it is a requirement, a rule, whatever term you prefer in the Catholic Church, that if you're divorced and remarried, you're not to receive Holy Communion. It's part of the Church's law. And people say, yeah, but those can change. True. But it's so inextricably linked 
to the doctrinal anchor, the doctrinal foundation that underpins it, that I, I think the argument can be made, really, Pope Benedict Emeritus and Cardinal Seurat are making the case that it shouldn't be changed. Now, they're talking about the idea of priestly celibacy. I just introduced in a different but somewhat related topic about divorce and remarriage, which is another one of the things on the chopping, chopping block right now. Another book I'd like to recommend to you is Why Celibacy? Reclaiming the Fatherhood of the Priest. This is by Father Carter Griffin. It's a fairly new book. I've got a copy. I've got a copy of both of these books. And uh, Kalen, I believe by now, has got a link to both of them on the show Twitter feed, so you can check them out. And this way, if somebody says, yeah, but in the early church, if you read these books, you're going to understand the reality of what was going on in the early church. Now, I've done a lot of talking, (laughs) and I'd like to hear from you. Uh, My number is 888-914-9149. We don't have to talk about this topic only, but it's it's up for grabs if you're interested in discussing it. I mainly just wanted to give you this update because it's unfolding right now, and uh, we we don't know yet what Pope Francis's response to this will be. It'll be very interesting to see, but judging from uh, what I'm seeing on Twitter, many people are buzzing about this, and I wanted to make sure that you were up to speed up to date. For more of the Patrick Madrid Show, visit relevantradio.com slash Patrick.